boy nistro here ycs niagara falls was this past weekend i went to locals i didn't really go to niagara because uh i don't have a passport so <laughs> it's not like i could have went anyway but the pie chart is here uh snake eyes as amina fire king was the biggest deck of the event it was half of top 32 and although not everyone has their list up on Yu-Gi-Oh pro deck yet we can see just about a good spread of what made it Sky Striker being piloted by Ryan Yu. This guy's been playing Sky Striker for longer than I've been born, even though Sky Striker has only been out for like, for what like seven, eight years now. It still feels like he's he's been piloting the deck like and doing well with it forever. That just doesn't seem like it's going to change anytime soon. But as you can see in his list, he's not using any Fuelos. If you look at the list of just about every other player, it's like Fuelos in main in first place, Tenpai Fuelos in main on top of a Perulia in main, Labyrinth. We got Full Wilson in main and three Perulia in main. You know, Snake Eye, Fire King, Snake Eye, Fire King. And it's like, yeah, you know, the some of the best, like three out of the four best decks all have Molcharmi in them. Molcharmi is going to maintain its price point because of that. Also, Dominus Impulse being another one that people are going to flock to because uh, it works in Labyrinth because all their monsters are dark. They couldn't really play the Dominus Purge. I mean, they could but they couldn't use it as like a hand trap. If they wanted to play Dominus Purge, they'd have to set it. Whereas in this deck, they could just use Impulse as a hand trap and as a set trap as well. So it's just very interesting, but the market's gonna go crazy. Impulse has already hit like 50 bucks. Uh, Fuelos, as I said, is gonna maintain this like 140 price point. What I thought was really interesting was that Exodia did end up making it to uh, the top 32 and this is a 800 almost 900 person event 875 duelists so i just wanted to highlight this exodia deck that did well at ycs niagara falls we got the five pieces three heart of the blue eyes and this is a good one because it adds a millennium on from deck to hand it also acts as an interruption in the graveyard because if if it's in the graveyard and, and you activated M millennium onk during the duel if your opponent summons a monster that's either level eight or higher or three has a more attack, he can special summon himself from the graveyard and by sending that monster to the grave. So it's almost like a Promethean princess on top of a, st a starter or a searcher. It's, it's not really a starter because Ankh doesn't really start your turn, but it could, right? So it's just more consistency and more interruption for the deck, which is going, which is really good. I mean, the deck already had like the OTK part of it going well it just needed a little more sauce in terms of just like getting started and like making stronger end boards and heart of the blue eyes is going to make sure that that happens second gen at three right this is one of your best starter pieces because it just searches any millennium monster from deck to hand on top of being able to summon itself golem he searches the field spell triple shield of the millennium dynasty and this also can search the onk when it's in the spawn trap zone so it's like you have uh six ways into the onk on top of having the onk itself so that can be pretty helpful you have a uh, triple ash blossom triple shifter double temple since it gets to pretty much place your millenniums from deck, so uh, you get access immediately to whichever one that, uh, to either the Seng Engine or uh, into the shield, uh, depending on what you open. Triple Onk, double Secret Village, because the Exodia Fusion's a spellcaster, so you sit on this like 6,000 attack monster that can negate a spell or trap, and that stops him from being able to activate. And you know, mix that with Secret Village, and that'll stop them from being able to activate spell cards. Terraforming and set rotation because getting access to your field spells are very important and uh, you you do kind of want to see wedge you a little more but secret village as a going first card definitely can't hurt the one of prosperity because consistency is bigger than going for game i do believe obliterate blaze is is going to make it so that you can probably game through a prosperity anyway so i don't think prosperity is a big deal in this deck triple triple tactics two fires of rage i didn't realize that this card was like the better one of the two because i looked at this and i looked at obliterate and i figured like you'd play one one it looks like two fires of rage is the way to go i haven't played with exodia yet and i'm gonna study up on this deck and make more content about it but i just think it's really interesting that for a deck that's like really simple like if you look at this list there's really nothing expensive here there's nothing that's really complicated about this deck. It's really more just a really effective going second deck that isn't Tenpai. You don't even have to really be good with Tenpai to do well with it. Whereas like this deck is more of a going second that's a little more technical, but has the same idea. And it also doesn't mind going first because the Exodia Fusion does get you spell and trap cards from the archetype. So it can set the fires of rage from straight from the deck and on top of being a spell and trap negate. And then you have uh, other monsters like Silla Hat Rabbit to set your 
your Azamoon, Sebek. I believe this is just for time. Aza, uh, IP, SP. What's really funny is that there's no Fiendsmith line in here. Like, they're actually using Moon of the Close Heaven the way it's supposed to be used, which is to make the Underworld Goddess using two monsters your opponent controls and not just one, if it's effect resolves. Cerberus, Phoenix, Unicorn, which, I mean, on top of SP, these are like the way better going second cards because these do not restrict you from attacking during your battle phase. Makes sense that a going second deck would play these, like I play Unicorn in Ancient Gears because you go Ballista, and then if you have just another body and you need to clear something, then you go Unicorn. Selene, because some of your best cards are spellcasters and you play a lot of spells, so it makes sense that Selene could work. Axis Code uh, makes sense, and Underworld Goddess for uh, swallowing up bodies. Ghost Sister and Spooky Dogwood, not just for time, but because if you face like a really combo heavy deck and they're special summoning like a lot, then it makes it so that you can survive more than one turn if you're facing like a snake eyes combo and they're summoning like dia bell star and a lot of these fusions both the azamina fusions like both the level six ones and then they're going into dia bell star and then they go promethean plus flameberg and then if they try to go like zealantis you're going to be gaining so much that they're not going to be able to game you in one turn even if they try so it's a more effective way of like instead of trying to stop them from playing can fuelos do good in this deck it definitely can I don't think Fulos is a bad choice for this deck, but what I am going to say is that it doesn't seem like it's necessary. I think there is enough uh, consistency, engine, and uh, breakers in this deck that you can kind of get through or get by kind of just playing like the bare minimum of like board breakers and you don't really need to spend the big bucks on those staples and the dominus cards wouldn't really do well in this deck because although your uh, main deck monsters are earth and light which would imply you should play the dominus purge your big swinger is a dark monster which means it conflicts with the purge and you can't use impulse because your engine is earth and light so it, it neither dominus card really works in this deck either really you don't really need to spend the money on those cards to play this deck so this deck is kind of like affordable by nature and you could play the mulch armies like you you, you definitely could if, if you already have them but i wouldn't go out buying mulch armies just to play this deck this and ryan Yu playing sky striker not having this like a hundred dollar card in their deck and still doing well does kind of fight the fact that the game is a, a little pay to play right now and it's it, it's good to see that, that that there are decks, even one like as iconic as the Exodia, that can still do well without needing to put up the big bucks. I'm sure you guys understand the the rest of this uh, side deck, like why it's here. It's, I don't really need to explain why board breakers are good or why D barrier is a decent card. Although I would I would have kind of assumed that you, if you're going to be on D barrier, like you would see like thrust. Like if, if you can go access code plus like one of your like Sengenjins, yeah, like access code plus Sengenjin is game because that's 53 plus 27 50 so if you can clear the board and then swing with those two that can still be game even through a dimensional barrier so there's definitely uh different ways that you can go about going for game depending on what you open and uh what what boards you're you're dealing with this has been a really interesting look at what exodia can do i will definitely look more into this deck in the future and uh, give you guys more of a breakdown of how I would pilot Exodia. I'm gonna start here because this is a good guide to the theory of the deck without inflating the, the price or like what's necessary to do well. Especially since like Shifter can do well against so many matchups, right? You know, Tactics is like simple but effective. Even with the five bricks in deck, the ability to get top 32 in a format with so many crazy combo decks seems like it, it it did pretty well for itself there's no like deck profile or video profile there's, it's not on here i mean youtube search oh here we go oh yeah i mean it, it would be funny if like you actually resolved exodia and you got a game because of that i mean but that's like a what like less than one percent chance that you'll see all five pieces of exodia in like an opening hand so that's funny well, that's something that, that you're not even thinking about when you're playing against this deck. It's like, man, I wonder if he draws all, all five pieces of Exodia. Like, do I just scoop? Like, that's crazy. Now, he does say that Ash or Ogre can stop you on the Millennium cards. And I, I do also have to say that if it's all one effect, that means Impulse can stop you as well. And Purge could stop you, actually, too. Because you are both specialing and trying to search in the same effect. So that means both... Both the Dominuses actually stop the Millennium cards from resolving in the Spell and Trap zone. Yeah, so both Purge, Impulse, oh, uh, Ghost Ogre, and Ash Blossom can beat this card. 
I don't think people were on Ghost Ogre as much as I thought they would be. Uh, just just a quick run through. Uh, do we see Ogre? No. Uh, no Ogre here. No Ogre here. No Ghost Ogre here. Yeah, like, I'm, I'm not seeing as much Ghost Ogre as I thought I would. I know Pac was on Ghost Ogre, and he made a uh, top 16 uh, with his Centurion list, and you guys can go watch uh, Pac's video on his deck list, because he was prepared for this event well before, I guess, other people were. The uh, Fulos, no, no Ogre. So I guess Ogre is still a bit niche. It's definitely not a bad card to play. I think it's it's a great card, but I, I just... It's, it's definitely not a card that everyone's using. U-Bell's on Ogre, yeah. It's because Ogre does do well against... It somewhat does well against U-Bell. It, it does better against, like, Azamina. And I don't know how many people were actually thinking they were going to face off against Azamina. Or maybe they thought, like, my engine does well like, in, into Azamina anyway, so I don't need to really play the Ogre. Yeah, it seems like Ogre isn't as popular at the moment. It's a bit more niche. The format's gonna need a little more time to develop before we make that call whether it's like necessary or not. Ooh, this shit's a heavy storm? Holy shit, I didn't even realize that. Holy shit. It like heavy storms and then it places all the equip spells from deck? That's wild. That's actually kind of nutty. I mean, so you're using it for, for Seeker Village. That makes sense. Okay, and all the Millennium Monsters work under Seeker Village. That's good to know. Okay, that makes sense. So you go into all the different Link attributes. And then you go for Selene Access Code, and then that allows you to clear like three, four more cards. Um, and they can't directly respond to Access Code, so it may be hard for them to deal with. On top of other board breakers, I think that's a good plan. Or the Exodia Fusion is good enough to where it's like, even if you don't kill them immediately, a simplified game state, it's, it's, a, it's a somewhat difficult card to get over. It's a good plan on his part just to focus on breaking the board so i guess yeah so the dark ruler makes sense evenly makes sense that's kind of the same idea i had with like goblin oh yeah also i forgot about that your exodia does gain attack equal to uh your life points so that does mean that like when you're if you resolve a spooky dogwood um and they stop and they use all their interruptions to stop everything but you still have the one millennium onk that can uh somewhat that that can get you to the exodia piece or to the Exodia Fusion, then the Exodia Fusion will have a ridiculous amount of attack that will punish them for even leaving anything in attack mode, regardless of how much attack it had. Um, because if they if they go first and they're summoning like seven, eight, nine monsters with like two thousand plus attack, that's going to be a ridiculous amount of life points that you're gaining. And at some point, they're going to have to ask themselves like, "Hey, is it worth it for me to keep playing to let them gain this amount of life points?" Even if the game doesn't go to time, it's like. This, this deck is dangerous enough to where having that much life points can be enough for them to make a comeback. So he did say he would change some stuff inside, but he didn't mention anything that he would change. I didn't see him talk about anything he would change, so. Uh, it looks like uh, his he was pretty confident with, with his list and, and what he was doing, so that's good to know. If you guys want to watch the full deck profile, it's on Pie for Life Games uh, right here. But that's been all uh for me about YCS Niagara. Let me know what you guys think in the comment section below. Are you guys planning to pick up a deck that doesn't play into Fuulos or like doesn't need Fuulos just so that you can continue playing or are you going to continue playing the deck that you've already been playing even if it does play into Fuulos? Let me know in the comment section down below. Until next time, this has been your boy Nistra here, signing out.